Now, <clears throat> Jesus is... Okay, this is on, right? Yeah. Okay. Jesus' messages to the churches are as applicable to us today as they were for the original congregation. Okay, Ephesus, <clears throat> it's infected with the spirit of judgment. And then Smyrna is in danger of just giving in. Pergamum is contaminated with the spirit of compromise. Thyatira tolerates false teachers. Sardis, it looks a lie, but it's a false front. They're dealing with hypocrisy. Philadelphia is doing well, <clears throat> but the folks need to stay strong to face what's coming. The congregation in Laodicea, oh my gosh, it says do nothing. Church, their problem is indifference. Now, Jesus identifies the need in each of the congregations and invites them to consider the situation which they find themselves in and then make the necessary changes to live a life of fidelity to Christ. Now, that same invitation is extended to us today. If you find that you are judgmental, in danger of giving up, have compromised in order to fit in, got caught up with some ridiculous false teaching, recognize some hypocrisy in your life, the need to stay strong, you're dealing with the struggles of life, or worst of all, you are living a do-nothing discipleship. Jesus says, hey, let's come to the table. Let's figure out what to do before it's too late to do anything. Now, coming to the table is what that seventh habit of disciple is all about. Contemplation. In contemplation, you deal with the deep things of your heart that need to be realigned with God's will and God's way. Now, everyone, everyone who overcomes is rewarded. Everyone who endures staying faithful is rewarded. And I want to see you rewarded. And if you need some help, hey, please let me know. Coaching is available. Okay. The message to Philadelphia uh, that Jesus spoke, he, the reward uh, of, of being acknowledged in the very throne room of God, being personally recognized before God and his holy angels. For those who overcome the indifference, they're given a seat at the table. And as we begin chapter 4, we're leaving earth and we're entering the throne room of God. And what proceeds now in the book of the Revelation is addressed to all of us, all the churches, and consequently you and me today. Chapter 4. Oh my goodness. It is awe-inspiring. It's shock and awe. More than you can comprehend. I mean, your jaw drops, the majesty, the radiance, the brilliance. It, it makes your eyes squint and your heart races and, and you, you forget to breathe. There's a certain terror involved. One that instead of repelling you, it draws you in, but it's terror nonetheless. The voice says, don't be afraid. Stand up. Come in. And you're speechless. Your words just fail you. You fall to your knees with your hands lifted high. You go flat on your face in adoration and you shout at the top of your lungs, glory! Lightning flashes and sounds of bone-rattling thunder shake the very ground that you're standing on. Indescribable, uncontainable, untamable, unimaginable. And John writes this. Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And then I looked, and oh, a door opened in heaven. And the trumpet voice, the first voice in my vision, called out, Ascend and enter, and I will show you what happens next. And I was caught at once in deep worship. And oh, a throne set in heaven with one seated on the throne, suffused with gem hues of amber and flame and a nimbus of emerald. Twenty-four Thrones circled that throne with 24 elders seated, white robed and gold crowned, and lightning flash and thunder crash pulsed from the throne. Seven fire blazing torches fronted the throne. These are the sevenfold spirit of God. Before the throne, it was like a crystal clear sea of glass. Prowling around the throne were four animals, all eyes, eyes that look ahead, eyes that look behind. The first of the animals looked like a lion, and the second like an ox, and the third had a human face, and the fourth with an eagle, looked like an eagle in flight, and the four animals were winged 
each with six wings, and they were all eyes seeing around and within, and they chanted night and day, never taking a break. Holy, holy, holy is God our master, sovereign strong, the was, the is, the coming. And every time the animals gave glory and honor and thanks to God, the one seated on the throne, the age after age living one, the 24 elders would fall prostrate before the one seated on the throne. And they worshiped the age after age, the living one, and they threw their crowns at his feet, chanting, Worthy, O Master, yes, O God, take the glory, the honor, the power. You created it all. It was created because you wanted it. So welcome to the throne room of the living God. The trumpet voice is Jesus inviting John to see what's coming. And John is in deep worship. He's in another vision. And in that worship, John is going to see worship. He's going to see exactly what he's going to see. In blazing light in the middle is a throne. And upon that throne sits someone that John just can't describe. It's too brilliant. There are reds and there's greens and there's oranges and whites and emanating all from, from the one that's seated, and you can't actually see the one who's seated. And there's a nimbus of emerald. It's a, a halo, a, a rainbow. And John can't really tell, but there's this emerald green light that surrounds the throne. And then there's a the heavenly council. They're also seated upon these thrones, and, and, and they are the administrators of God's will. Now, now, seated means that they have authority to carry out God's commands. They're in white robes, which represents the righteousness of God. White clothing represents purity and holiness and spiritual um, perfection. And only those God declares to be worthy wear white. Okay, Only those in white can stand in the presence of God. And that is a gift from him. Now, the heads of those upon the, those 24 thrones are adorned with golden crowns, and that signifies power and majesty. They have the status of kings and priests, authority to carry out God's designs for his creation. Now, we've been given a glimpse, just enough information to speculate that these elders are probably the divine council that we read about in Psalm 82. They're the heavenly council that we read about in Job chapter 1. They're the host of heaven that we read about in 1 Kings. Now the seven blazing lamps represent the Holy Spirit. The original language can be translated as the sevenfold spirit. The Holy Spirit standing before the throne signifies God's omnipresence, his all-encompassing power. So you see the spirit as a flame, it's not confined to one specific location. But the Holy Spirit permeates all of creation, and by the Spirit, God is everywhere. The sevenfold Spirit standing before the throne is imagery that conveys a sense of deep connection and fellowship. Before the throne, the Spirit is not an attendant as the elders are, but rather a beloved and companion, a confidant. Romans 8, right? 8, 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know how or ought we, uh, uh, how we should pray, what we should pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans, and He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So in our Trinitarian understanding of Father, Son, Spirit, your prayers have no intermediary. All right? When you pray, you are poetically, spiritually standing before the living God, before the throne. So before the throne and the sevenfold spirit is what looks like a sea of glass. It's crystal clear. Now again, John is at a loss for words. What looks like a sea is the foundation upon which the throne is, is placed. And it suggests that God's rule and authority are grounded in purity and clarity. That there are no waves of, in the sea speaks of an unyielding, unshakable foundation of God's reign. Now, we can also speculate that the sea's translucency, being clear as crystal, represents God's openness 
and accessibility to those who seek his presence. Now, in Judaism, we might see a prophetic word in the sea like glass, in that Ezekiel foretells that the earthly sea is going to be transformed as a sign of peace and harmony in the messianic era. Now, in and around the throne are four living creatures. Now, we can draw a parallel with Ezekiel's vision of the angels that are called cherubim. The cherubim serve as guardians. It's a, a cherubim that blocks the way to the tree of life in Genesis. It's two cherubim that decorated the Ark of the Covenant. It's uh, In a book that's not in your Bible called Enoch, the cherubim are identified as the guardians of the throne of God. And here they are in the throne room of God. They move about this expanse and they call out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. It's a chorus of praise. We find it throughout the Old Testament. Now, later in the book, the Revelation, the title, who was and is and is to come, is going to change, marking the consummation of the kingdom. And we're going to read it. It's going to happen. The one who was and is, he's arrived. And he will be with us physically. Well, this song of the cherubim that goes on day and night, this recessic, uh, uh, it's reminiscent uh, of morning and evening prayers. Okay? Psalm 113, verse 3. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord shall be praised. And that's what I think about. Morning and evening prayers. And as the four living creatures give glory and honor and thanks, the elders join in. They leave their thrones, their seats, and they fall before the throne, laying their crowns before the throne. And that is a sign of complete and utter submission. It's a sign of being fully surrendered to doing the will of God. Now we can speculate that these elders have been around a long time, created sometime near the beginning. And they have seen, they know, they've been a part of God's unfolding plan from the beginning. And they proclaim that God is worthy of worship because they know. Worthy, O Master. Yes, our God. Take the glory, the honor, the power. You created it all. It was created because you wanted it. Now, there's something hidden here. Worthy, O Master. Yes, our God. In the original language, this praise to God, this title can be translated Lord and God. Very simple, Lord and God. But what's hidden to us is that this is also the official title that the Roman Emperor Domitian, or however you pronounce that name, claimed for himself. I am the Emperor, Lord and God. Well, to call the one on the throne Lord and God in that time was a triumphant confession of who all your loyalty was to be given. My friends, things on earth look bad. Right? What's going on in those churches? Oppression, persecution, martyrdom for the redeemed on the earth. Things on earth are, are heading from bad to worse as we're going to find out shortly. But here we see that God is not unaware of what the churches are going through, what you are going through. From the throne room, God reigns. This is where it all happens. From this scene, we know that God is in charge no matter how things look down here. And we know in that throne room, God is worship. And it's a call to all believers everywhere throughout the ages to worship. Trust that God is in charge. Even though the world seems like nothing but chaos, God is on the throne. His will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Things are rough. Times intense, maybe even catastrophic. But we have hope because our God reigns. Now, from the scene... We know that believers are to join in in unending praise and worship. From grateful hearts, we're to join in that throne room, 
giving God his due. The times coming will be bad. They will be. But victory is secure. Don't give up. Don't forsake the faith. Do his will to the very end. Now, consider what awaits. The rewards that we read about. The right to eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. That's yours. Redemption from the second death. Spiritual death. That's yours. A new name that gives you total access. I love it. Authority to rule with Christ. You wear those robes of white and your name will never be blotted out of the book of life. You'll be made a pillar with the marks that God possesses you. Citizenship in the new Jerusalem. All coming with a more intimate knowledge of Jesus. You'll be given a place at Jesus' table. Don't give up. Don't give in. 1 Corinthians 2.9 No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart has imagined what God has prepared for those that love Him. Be that person that loves God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. It's going to be tough. It is going to be hard. You may be persecuted. They may kill you because of your belief. But great is your reward because our God 